you guys who are visiting, please nudge your friend, text your friend. They will send you the lesson notes. Otherwise, if you've got a Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Oh, yes. This thing's on. <laughs> All right. Well, the theme of today's service is, of course, back to life. Right. And, I mean, you guys have seen that. I mean, coming to church, like you got an invitation that says back to life on it, right? right. right. You know, and, and why are we talking about back to life? Obviously, we had Easter, which was last week. And we all had a holiday. Some of us may have had to go into the lab to finish our PhD or whatever it is. Not me, but uh, someone in this room, some people in this room, okay? Come on. <laughs> you know, but you know, we had a whole like, holiday dedicated to it. You know, Easter is all about Jesus coming back to life, right? Yes. And you know, when we think about it, as Christians, we're supposed to think about Jesus coming back to life, and we're supposed to think about it every single day. So in that way, it's sort of like every day is Easter. It's kind of like when you want to celebrate your birthday, and then you just sort of go, yeah, every day is my birthday. Or this week, this whole week is my birthday week. Or sometimes you sign up to those, you know when you sign up to those memberships at certain restaurants or milk tea shop, and it's like, when it's your birthday, they give you a free drink or free upgrade. And sometimes they, you know, it depends on which shop you go to. Usually they give you maybe a few days, three days before and after. Yeah. But I know a shop, like I remember going to a shop where the whole month. Wow. You, didn't, you, can, you, know, you can only get one free drink, but you could get it whenever in that whole month. Yeah. And I was like, man, I feel like my birthday is ev- the whole, every day of the whole month. Wow. You know, every day is Easter. We're meant to be thinking about it, right? But yet today, our service is entitled Back to Life. Wow. Amen. And I think it's really cool because it is also the time when we are coming back to life, sort of, you know, coming out of lockdown and everything. And yet, the resurrection is the crux of Christianity. I was thinking about this word, the crux, and I was like, I mean, the word itself, C-R-U-X, it means the most important part of it. It's the central part of Christianity. But actually, I was thinking about it, I was like, wait, actually, this word also means cross. It is because the cross is the most important thing. You know, it's the most important thing we talk about, and that's what we're going to talk about today, the resurrection. Right. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 to 5, says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like this. Wow. Wow. So obviously we believe that Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and on the third day he was resurrected by God. And you go, James, what is the relevance of this? Who cares? I mean, it's really cool for that guy who came back to life, right? Right. And maybe it was cool for the people who got to see this guy come back to life. But that was 2,000 years ago. You know, why can't God resurrect someone today? I mean, it's also kind of like, if you want stories like that, you can just Google one on the internet. There's actually a lot of stories of people coming back to life. But, you know, it really counts on when you think someone's dead. Like, you know, someone does CPR on someone for 12 hours, and then, like, they come, and then they suddenly come back to life. You're like, whoa. Or, like, 16 hours. Where do you really draw the line? And yet Jesus had no one doing CPR on him for three days, and then he just came back to life. Amen? But the relevance of this is this. As Christians, we are meant to undergo the same process. We die to sin, we're buried in baptism, and we are raised to a new life. Hence why when you become a Christian, you really do get a new life. Come on. It's like, it's actually, when you think about it, that is something that everyone wants. Yeah. Whether it's you think about ancient stories of these kings who, who had everything they wanted in life, then they were like, man, I want this even in the next life. I'm going to look for life after death. Yeah. Whether it's you look at any video game or any game that we've ever played, why is it you play like something like Mario and there's three lives? <laughs> you know, you think about it, even if you play a game that's only got one life, when you die, you can just play it again. Right. You can just start a new game. If you made a video game where you could only play it one time and the moment you failed or you lost or you died in the game, the CD or the the file would just delete itself and you can never play it again. No one would buy a game like that. Because if you have something like that, we can just do that in real life. Like, you know, if you want 
a, a place where you can only get one chance of things, well, just do it in real life. There's only one chance. There's no resurrection. And yet people really want to have another chance of things, don't they? That's the number one biggest regret. People go, I want another chance. Be it relationships, be it life, be it your choices, be it opportunities that you missed for whatever reason. Maybe you were too afraid to do it. Maybe you were like, man, I can do it later. But it turns out actually you can't. People are looking for a new life. And you know, you go, man, in Christianity, you get a new life. But to be resurrected, first, you have to die. Ooh, and that's not the fun part, right? Everyone wants to be resurrected. Who wants to be raised from the dead? Who wants to die? No, nobody, okay? Nobody wants to die. But if you don't die, you can't actually be brought back to life. Right. Makes sense, right? If you were never put into quarantine, then you'll never understand the joy of being released from quarantine. Yeah. 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 Nobody wants to die. Right. Yeah. And yet dying is simply a reality of life. Wow. The only question is, do you realize that you are dead? My question for you guys today is, are you dead spiritually? You know, what areas of your life desperately need change? Which areas of your life are crying out to you, like trying to get your attention? Hey, you were suffering over here. But you've been putting it off or failing to change. Got three points for you guys today. Point one, have you gotten used to being dead. Whoa. Have you gotten used to being dead? John 18, 37 to 38. You know, have you given up on truth? John 18, 37 to 38. Here's a conversation between Jesus and Pilate, the man who was about to sentence him to death. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Wow. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. You know, there is a truth about the world. A truth about God, a truth about life, and the meaning of life. Yeah. You know, this truth is not only real, not only not subjective, it's very real. Yeah. It's achievable, mm -hmm. findable, you can grab hold of it. But also, this truth is to be testified to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there are two men in this conversation. Right. And you know, imagine yourself there. You have Pilate in his royal robes. Right. He's a governor, he's a representative of the king. Yeah. He would have looked really fancy, he had a shower last night, everything like that. Then you had Jesus on the other side. He was beaten up last night. That's true. He was beaten up, he was in chains, he was about to die. And yet in this situation, Jesus was the one spiritually alive, spiritually free. Even him dying is actually of his own choice, of his own will. And yet Pilate, on the other hand, he is the one spiritually dead. He had given up on truth. He goes, what is truth? You know, to be, there, Jesus spent his life and his time testifying to the truth. As Christians, this is also our purpose. Right, yeah to fish for men and to seek and save the lost. Yes. It's to help find people and study the Bible and help them to know God right. so that they will also become Christians. Yeah. To be faithful to Jesus is to persevere in our testimony of him. Yep. Did you allow the pandemic to stop you from evangelizing and bringing people to Jesus? Wow. You know, around the world, all of our different churches around the world, you know, it's really cool to see there are two areas of the world that never really went into a lockdown. One is French Africa. All the churches in French Africa and the Cameroon and the, you know, Congo and all those different countries, right. they never went into a lockdown because their, their, their societies just never did it. They were just like, okay, we'll wear masks, but we can't really stay at home. We'll all die. Like, the economy will just stop, everything like that. Yeah. So as a society, they never had a lockdown. The other place that never really had a lockdown is London. And But this is a different case. This is the case of the church going, there's COVID everywhere, we're going to preach anyway. And yet these two places are the only two places in the last year, two years, that have seen biblical growth. Wow. I'll give you an example of the capital of Cameroon, which is Yaoundé. 
This was a church that was started in June 2021. There was less than 20 missionaries starting the church. And since June until, until the beginning of April, I believe, they have had 115 baptisms. Whoa. They had 115 baptisms, 115 people from less than 20 people who wanted to know Jesus since June. Right. And that have given up everything to do the same thing. And they're about to send their fourth mission team up wow. since June. That's four churches planted since a church of 20 started wow. less than 12 months ago. Come on. You know, in, in this time we've had house churches. And I gotta, you know, talk about something, you know, that Lana and I at the very beginning made a decision. We're like, okay, house churches, it's limited space. Be, you know, be very selective in who you invite to church. This was a mistake. This was wrong. Because we actually stopped evangelizing, stopped bringing people to church. And we need to bring people to church. We need to study the Bible with people because that is our purpose. You know, and that was uh, primarily myself allowing fear of getting in trouble to impact my leadership of the church. And that's wrong. You know, why is Evelyn, you know, it's awesome to see Leo and Evelyn married yesterday. They were married here. They'll be back next week. But you know, why is Evelyn, Evelyn has been fruitful like two, three times within like 12 months. How does she do it? If you ask her, she'll say, man, I pray. And which is true, she does pray. You know, she goes, you know, some other, if you ask someone else, they might go, she is spiritual. Yeah. She, she, she's close to God. We go, that is also true. But why is Evelyn fruitful? It's because she evangelizes all the time. Actually, once you get a little bit deeper, she's studying. She's still doing her master's, right? She's studying uh, her course, whatever. When she, tells, uh, she, when she wants to take a break from studies, she goes over to Leo, go over to one of the sisters. Hey, can we go and invite people right. to study the Bible? Come on. Can we go evangelize? Can we go share it? She does that for fun. Like, she does that in her breaks. Oh. That is why she has been fruitful yeah. more than twice, or twice or something like that in the last 12 months. Yeah. You know, we need to get back to daily evangelism. We need to find people to study the Bible with. Right. You know, it's, like, it's one of those things where if you want to do something for God, then just do it. If you want to do something great for God, then just do it. If you don't know how to do it, then get some advice and then do it. You know, I do want to lift up an example we have of our brother Vinny in Brazil. And Vinny is now a geographic sector leader, which means he leads five churches. How did he do it? Well, in the pandemic, he was like, you know, our, our, our conference got canceled because of COVID. Let's send out a mission team. Let's start a new church. And between February, when his auntie and grandmother were baptized in a different city until April he's already organized and planted a mission team in that city like her, his, there was no church where his grandmother and his auntie were living he studied the Bible with them anyway they got baptized and he was like well they're baptized now and they're all the way over there let's start a church in their city so he started a church in Sao Carlo you know I think about you know why is Kip so effective in leading the movement when you really when you see what he actually did as a by the, time, by the time he was my age, he had already, you know, became a Christian when he was 17. Then he started a weekly Bible study in his dorm, in his university dorm. And in that time, for three years, he had a weekly Bible study. And he not only baptized his brother, he also baptized eight other men at his campus dorms. And others. That's just counting the ones who lived in his dorms. You know, and by the time he was 25, and by the time he was my age, he'd already had like 300 baptisms or something like that. Wow. You know, we've got to be back to seeking and saving the lost and making disciples. Right. Wow. That's Jesus. Okay, Jesus was all about testifying to the truth. Then you had Pilate, this other guy. This guy had given up on truth. He you know, says here that he retorted. What is a retort? It's a sharp or retaliating reply to contradict what the other person said. Jesus goes, man, if I testify to the truth, and Pilate's like, what is truth? He's not, he's not even, he didn't even wait for Jesus to answer the question. It's not a real question. He's just upset and he'd given up on the fact. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he saw truth as impossible. He had given up looking for righteousness, and he was just looking for the least worst option. Oh. Isn't that sad sometimes? People in life, rather than looking for which is the best option, Oftentimes, you're looking for which is the least worst option. Which is the option that it will hurt me the least? Rather than which option will bring the most good to everyone. 
You know, many people start out young and optimistic, hoping to change the world. But then when they found out how difficult it really is, they give up and just try to save their own life. Wow. And it is true. It's true. Changing the world's hard because that is God's job. And you can only do it if you're on God's side. You know, the world is lost and it's full of evil. This is the truth. Anyone who says anything otherwise, you know, there is good in it. But you look at the whole world, you can't say the world's good. The world's pretty messed up. There are messed up things in it. People simply justify it because they've given up on changing the world. Have you been living in your sinful life for so long that you've given up on hope of change? You know, I had a friend back in uh, Sydney, and she said her, her father taught her a saying, which was, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. Which is like one of those things that, I don't know if you guys know Australian culture, it's a very important teaching in Australian culture because they like to do crazy things. So it's like, just because you can doesn't mean you should. When I heard that, I was like, that's a pretty good saying. I'm going to steal it, but I'm going to flip it around. Just because you cannot do it does not mean you shouldn't. Why should you let something that's impossible stop you from trying to do it if it's right? You know, do you realize how lost you are? Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 to 17. You know, this is a scripture to a church. Hopefully, it's not you today, but maybe it could be. Revelation 3, 14 to 17 says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You know, there are three spiritual temperatures for every person. Which are you? Hot, cold, and lukewarm. Right. How is that true? You know, there's so many different degrees on the scale. How can that be true? Well, you're either hot, then hot is very different to cold. Right. And if you're not hot and you're not cold, then it makes you lukewarm. Yep. What are things that are hot? The sun. The sun's really hot. Right. Uh, apparently there's a saying somewhere, there's a legend somewhere that Kim Jong-un walked on the sun. That <laughs> is going to be very hot. <laughs> what else is hot? Fire is hot. Fire. I don't mean like a little matchstick, like even a candle, right? If, uh, you know, I appreciate the brothers, they were coming over after midnight and they, they didn't have a cake or anything like that. So they brought like a scenting candle, a candle that you light for, for a smell good. And they brought that to me, Alvin did, uh, brought it to me and was like, happy birthday, bro. And it's one of those candles that, it's not a birthday candle, it's, it's a candle for smelling good, right? And I was like, oh, thank you so much. And I grabbed it and I gave it back. I was like, ouch, it's too hot. But the fire is hot. Even a small fire is really hot. Right. Right. Never mind, I don't know if you guys have been near a big fire. It's like you, you, you walk around the corner and you can see the fire. As soon as you can see it, it's already hot. Yeah. And then you go around the corner, you cannot see it. It's actually less hot already. Right. What else is hot? An oven. I actually have a burn mark on my wrist here. It's under my uh, sleeve. Right. But it's where, you know how if you're using an oven, I don't know if, I mean, Hong Kong has no ovens here. Some of you, maybe if you're lucky, you may have an oven. But in the oven, you know, if you hold something that was in the oven, you're gonna burn your hand, so you have a glove. Right. But one time I was putting, my, uh, putting this lasagna into the oven, and um, part of the glove, which is meant to protect my arm here, right. it fell down. Oh. And so I touched it for a brief second, I was like, oh, it's so hot. And I immediately put it under cold water, everything, there is still a scar to this day, because it's so hot. Oh. What are things that are cold? Ice cream, ice cream's pretty cold. You eat it and it's a little bit too cold, and you're like, ow, brain freeze. Right. The freezer is cold. You're like, you open it, you're like, Let, let's, let's close it so that we don't waste the electricity because it's so cold. Yes. Air conditioning yes. is nice and cold. Come on. And yet, lukewarm is somewhere in between those two things. In between hot and cold is lukewarm. There's nothing more frustrating than turning on the air conditioner and the air comes out and it's exactly, it feels exactly the same as the air that is behind you as well. That is the most frustrating thing. You know, being hot can cook food so you can eat it. Being cold can preserve food so that you can cook it later. But lukewarm food spoils. Is your spiritual life spoiling? 
if you're not sure of your heart, then you're either cold or you're lukewarm. And the Bible says that Jesus spits lukewarm Christians out of his mouth. You know, just because everyone else in your church is a certain way doesn't make it right. You could all just be doing it wrong. You know, disciples of Jesus give up everything for God. If, it's some, if something in your life is stopping you from getting closer to God, or if something in, in your life is making it less likely that you're going to go to heaven, you have got to get rid of it. Right. It's like one of those things. If, if, you know, if I told you, hey, I'll give you, I'll, I'll let you read this book. I'll let, I'll let you study this material for your exam. Right. And it has a 1% chance, a 99% chance of doing nothing. 1% chance of making you fail your exam. Are you going to read it? You're going to be like, no. It, it's going to make me fail. My, it might not, but it might make me fail my exam. And I don't want that. Right. Whether it's job. If your job makes you, stops you from giving up everything for God, right. get rid of it. Yep. If there is a relationship that stops you from being close to God, get rid of it. Oh. If your friends and your friendship circle do not help you to get closer to God and to get to heaven, get rid of it. Right. You know, it's, it's just like in smoking. When people try to quit smoking, they often change their friendship groups. Why? Because smoking is one of those social things that people do with their friends. So if you are trying to stop smoking and you're still hanging out with people that smoke all the time, that's not going to help you stop smoking. Yeah. So people who are serious about quitting smoking, they, they change their friendship groups. They just do it. And they actually sometimes they even go to like different groups that are like just other people who are also trying to quit. Because they're trying to swap their friendship group with people who will help them quit yes. and understand what it's like to quit. Right. You know, I, I, do have a, I do have this cr a great story about uh, what it's like to be lukewarm. Um, it's from my friend Sean, who is uh, leading our New Zealand church. And it's, great, it's a great story. He was once walking along the street with his, with his other friend. And then there was a dog just laying by the side of the road. So he's just chilling there. It's pretty cool. And the friend goes, oh, that's pretty cool. That dog, that dog's, oh, I've, I've seen that dog before. And, and uh, Sean was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then the guy's like, no, yeah, I saw it like last time right there as well. And then uh, Sean goes, Okay, wait, how long ago did you see this dog over there? And Sven goes, yeah, I saw it there two weeks ago. It was lying right there two weeks ago. Wow. And Sean goes, you saw it there two weeks ago, and it's exactly the same dog. <laughs> yes. You saw it two weeks ago, it's exactly the same spot. Yes. <laughs> Bro, that dog's dead. <laughs> dog. And the guy was like, no, 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 I'm, it's, just, it's just chilling there. It's fine. It, it's, not, it's not dead. Sean goes, bro, you saw it there two weeks ago. It hasn't moved in two weeks. Bro, I'm pretty sure that dog is dead. Yeah. Mm. Oh. When was the last time your faith made you do something? Wow. Or have you been sitting still for weeks, months, or even years? Wow. 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 You know, the thing about being hot is that it's uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. Being oh. fully committed and fired up is the only way to follow Jesus. Yeah. If you're not fired up, you're watered down. Yeah. And watering down the standard of Jesus is accepting being lost and going into hell. That's true. It's like that meme. You know that meme that goes like, well, I guess I'll die. That's what it's like to be cold or lukewarm. That's true. Oh man, I'm not doing what Jesus is saying, but uh, I guess I'll lay it down and die. Yeah. You know, the question for you guys to say is, would Jesus live the life that you lived in this past week? If not, you are not following Jesus. Do you realize how lost Jesus sees you as? Or have you gotten used to being spiritually dead? Point number two, do you believe in resurrection? Romans chapter 4, verse 18 to 21. Romans 4, 18 to 21. You know, the word resurrection, it, it's just simply the act of raising from the dead. You were dead and now you are not. Right. Romans 4, 18, 21 says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it even said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. 
You know, there may be things about you that you think are impossible to change. Amen. It, 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 man, the situation is dead. It, it's totally gone, too far gone. It can't, you know, that's the definition of being dead, isn't it? It's a point when there is no hope. It's over. Right. It's right. over. And yet, no situation in your life will be as dead as Abraham and Sarah having a child. <laughs> yeah. Ab you'll never, your situation in your life will never be as dead as a hundred-year-old man trying to have a kid with his wife who is 90. Oh. It will never be that bad That's in your true. life. Come on. You know, why is the resurrection of Jesus so important to Christianity? Because we must believe that God has power to raise things, raise people from the dead, and that he does. You know, resurrection is by definition impossible. It's not possible, otherwise it's not resurrection. You know, I was having this conversation with Nicole the other day about, you know, mixing up the words resurrection and resuscitation. Ah. And resuscitation is where you do CPR. That actually, the R in CPR stands for resuscitation. Right. And so, resuscitation is when someone has not yet actually died. Yeah. Oh. And you bring them from almost dead back to, full, back to life. Right. Oh. Resurrection is, they're dead. They, they can't come back. But yet, they somehow still did. Mm -hmm. You know, it's taking an impossible situation, a situation with no hope, and giving it hope. The Bible says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Yep. Right. This is why death takes such a unique spot in our hearts and in our society. It is the ultimate situation where there is no hope. Right. And yet God is a God who has the power to raise from the dead. Mm -hmm. What is the most dead situation in your life that you think God cannot fix? Mm -hmm. You know, the news is that God will not only fix it, he's going to bring it back to life. That's not just a little bit better. You know, if, if someone goes from dead to living, you're gonna, not going to be like, that's an improvement. You're going to go, wow, totally different change. You know, I think uh, impossible situations uh, or, or life and death and things like that. You know, recently, not too long ago, I had to go to my grandfather's funeral. It was in the middle of COVID and everything like that. It was a little bit complicated because of the restrictions, but it was okay. You know, he was 94. And in many ways, I always saw that as like an impossible situation. He's dead. Uh, he's dead now, so definitely impossible. Um, but you know, even beforehand, you know, even for me going to share my faith with him, oh, man, he's got a stroke, there's a language barrier. How is this gonna happen? And yet, there's just so many inspiring stories all around the world. And I love having a worldwide movement, a worldwide family of churches. You know, Lan and I had the privilege of speaking to the uh, church leaders in New Delhi. And they had just baptized a lady who's 105 years old. Her name is Chandra, Chandra Wati. You know, and, 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 it was, and the situation itself was really crazy. They didn't even like, you know, where do you go to evangelize to meet someone who's 105, you know what I mean? But it was like someone, they were someone they met um, in evangelism whose friend started studying the Bible, and then for some reason, her, her grandmother, her mother-in-law next door to the Bible study just started to make some noise when she heard the word being preached. And she goes, like, I want to come over. Like, bring, she was making noises, so they sent people over to check on her. And she's like, I want to go here. Bring me to the Bible study. Wow. You know, you've got to choose to believe God's reality. Anything and anyone can be resurrected. She's not even baptized. She's your sister in Christ, and she's doing awesome. Uh, you know, Mark chapter 9, verse 20 to 27. There's another story about Jesus raising from the dead. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father explained, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Yeah. You know, this was a situation where there was this guy in an impossible situation. You know, the boy has been demon-possessed. 
demon, demon possessed since his childhood, since he was a little boy. And the boy, his father has tried everything. Brought him to this th situation, this person, to see if he can find a cure. And he never found anything or anyone that could help save his son. Right. You know, he had barely any hope left when he met Jesus. He went to Jesus and was like, if you can do anything, please help me. He was desperate. Right. Except he said that to the wrong man. Wow. He yeah. said that's the only one who has the authority to do these things. And for Jesus, it's like easy. He's God. True. Right. It's like one of those things. If you believe in a God, and if you believe in a God that created the whole world, which is harder, to raise someone from the dead or to make the whole world? Yeah. Imagine, you know, making someone. It's like a, it's like a little child going over to Nick Cave, who's studying for a PhD, going, can you, if you can, can you please help me solve three plus four? Nick is gonna be like, what do you mean if I can? Like this is a joke, right? <laughs> and yet Jesus here, he goes, man. He goes, man, the father, man, like, he's like, I don't know if he was laughing, laughing or whatever. He was like, he challenges the father to believe. He doesn't even like, let me help you, let me persuade you, let me uh, show you that I can do it. No, he was like, no, you gotta believe. He challenges him to believe. Because believing is a decision to overcome your emotions and your feelings of unbelief. Yeah. And notice even when we study the Bible with people, there are, people, there are plenty of people I study the Bible with that have not believed. And yet over five, six years of studying the Bible with people, there's really only been maybe a handful, maybe five or six people that have had a pretty good reason why they did not believe in God. Okay. Right? And even studying the Bible with them, as we began to engage these topics, most of the time it just ended up boiling down to, I just don't want to believe because of this reason or that reason. My mother is against it. My, I, I just can't understand how my friend can be going to hell. I can't accept that. I can't accept that my parents are going to hell or something like that. You know, unbelief is cowardice because you're taking your emotions of unbelief, but you're refusing to face the facts of God. And there are people that have overcome unbelief. Some people that have been unreligious. Yeah. I think about you know Scott that we had earlier coming up here. Scott? It's really awesome. The first time I met Scott, you know, I was told again the brothers studied the Bible with me, uh, studied the Bible with him, told me that yeah, this, this guy Scott he wants to become a Christian. He believes in God already, even though he didn't used to. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I get with Scott, and I'm like, okay, you know, okay, you know what, you want to study the Bible? Great, that's awesome. You know, where are you from? All these different things. And I was like, hey, Scott, do you believe in God? He goes, actually, no. <laughs> Oh, that was a long time ago. That was, that was a few months ago. And it, through studying the Bible, then it got to the end where we were just before um, we were, he was going to get baptized. He was coming up to me. I was like, I want to become a Christian. He was coming up to me. I didn't even ask him to become a Christian. He was coming up to me. Yep. And I was like, so you believe in God now? He goes, yes. And they go, well, actually, the main thing is I asked him, hey, why do you want to become a Christian? He goes, I don't want to go to hell this week. Um, oh. As opposed to any other week. But anyways, I was like, so you believe in heaven and hell? He goes, yes. You believe in God? Yes. And I was like, wow. And it's the power of studying the Bible. Come on. Yeah. And of course, you know, there was Bo Zhao who was up here to introduce God earlier. And Bo Zhao himself had come from an unbelieving, atheistic background. And he had come to believe in God. You know, there are, and there are also religious unbelief. You believe in God, but you somehow don't believe the scriptures. How do I know you don't believe the scriptures? Because you're not practicing. Ooh. And it just comes down to a point where you go, no, that's impossible. Nothing is impossible with God. When you're religious and you, and you have unbelief, it's because you've been playing by the wrong rules yeah. this whole time. When you finally see true discipleship, then you will see the true power of God. You know, believing in the resurrection is believing that the impossible can be done by God. It is believing that God is the answer to your impossible situations. You know, for, for, while I was preparing this lesson, I was looking up comebacks in sports, because I think of impossible things, right? And I think of in, like comebacks in sports, whether it's, whether it's sports basketball or soccer or American football, baseball, whatever it is. There's always all these different stories. And actually, you just look up impossible comebacks, just enter into Google, and there's like a billion different stories of impossible comebacks. And yeah, I realized, I, I wanted to take a story and put it in the sermon, and I was like, man, it just doesn't quite feel the same. 
you know, unless you, maybe you play the sport and you know it's impossible to score like 150 points in the game or something like that in the basketball game. Like unless you're a basketball player, then you get that. But if you're not, you, you don't really feel the emotion of having done something impossible. Yeah. Yeah. And also the other thing is once it's been done, it doesn't feel impossible anymore. Yeah. It's like, um, yeah, it just, it just, even, you know, we had, uh, if you guys know basketball, a basketball example. There was a team a few years back that got 73 wins in the, out of 80, 82 games or something like that. And that was the Golden State Warriors, amen? Um, and, you know, they had, they had no team had ever even come close to winning that many games throughout the year. And they were like, man, this is the best team of all, hist of all time, all history, all these things. And yet they got to the finals against LeBron James, amen? <laughs> and they were winning. They were winning 3-1. to one. And only a few teams ever come back from 3-1 to one before. And yet, they were still, the underdogs were still trying to overcome and win. And yet, you read it now and you're like, oh yeah, of course, it's because it's LeBron James or whatever reasons you have or anything like that. But it's not, it doesn't feel impossible anymore because it's been done. Really, when you say that's impossible, it's like, no, you've just never seen it before. You know what I mean? You've just never seen it before. If you ask someone a few hundred years ago, we're going to have planes in the sky that can fly themselves. And, you know, uh, and, and we can have computers that can do calculations by themselves. And you can have, like, virtual reality and all these different things. People will be like, yeah, you're a witch. Burn you. Or something like that, right? Because yeah. they go, we've never seen that before. It's impossible. Right. Yeah. You know, even, again, the example I was talking about earlier with Mrs. Chandrawati, the lady baptized in 105. Mm. She was baptized in two days of studying the Bible. Yeah. Two days. You can never give up on God. Oh. Point number three, do whatever it takes to come alive. Come on. Come on. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. Live, don't die. <laughs> Ezekiel 33, 11 says, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather they turn from their ways and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Wow. No, with God, it's very simple. God doesn't want anyone to die. Yep. It's very simple. He wants you to turn to Him and live. To turn away from evil and live. He is looking for repentance. Right. You, can, you know, when faced with the facts that you are lost, that you are spiritually dead or lukewarm, yeah. you can either lay down and die, or turn to him, fight for him, and live. Yeah. You know, you can't be paralyzed by fear. You really got to go, what is the right thing to do today? Yeah. Right now. Because you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow anyway. Mm -hmm. Why do you worry about what will happen tomorrow? Sure. You know, underdogs win. Yeah. Why? Because they have nothing left to lose. Whoa. They have lost so much. They go, man, if we lose, that's just normal. So they give up everything in order to fight to win. That's true. And because they give up everything to win, they do win. And we are trying to win life. You know, life comes at a high cost. Are you ready to do whatever it takes? 2 Corinthians 7, 10 to 11. This describes the attitude of repentance. It's an attitude of, I will do whatever it takes. Right. One word. 2 Corinthians 7, 10 to 11. Right. Tis godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. You know, repentance, having godly sorrow, sorry towards God, it produces a different response. Yeah. It produces a response that is eager, that is earnest. It's not just trying to appeal to people, not just trying to please man, but you're genuinely trying to change. And there is no, there is no regret. And you just go back, that's what I used to do. There is acceptance and there is change. And there is a readiness to see, to prove yourself innocent at every single point. You know, repentance is an attitude. Where there's a will, there's a way. That's, right. the, that's the famous saying, right? right? And yet the truth is that there is always a way. Yeah. If you have the will, find the way. 
You gotta change your vocabulary. I cannot, you gotta take that and replace that with I lack the will to see this through. Wow. You know, a few years ago, there was a couple in the church who was really struggling because uh, they were uh, Christians in our church over in Sydney. And they're married and everything like that, and it was great. But uh, uh, the brother had just lost his job. Oh. Had just lost his job. Then uh, the, the sister had just moved in from overseas. So she, had, she was waiting for her visa to start working, but she hadn't got it yet. Right. So they were on no income, and their savings were going down really quickly. Right. And you know, we do have bedevolence where we try and help out our brothers and sisters in the church who are in a time of need. Right. And that would qualify as a time of need. Because right. they were out of money, they couldn't pay their bills, this, that, this, that. Right. And yet, when they asked for benevolence, it was like, well, once you demonstrate that you've tried everything, then we, and you still can't get the money, then we will help you. Mm. So we're like, well, you and your wife, go out, get some water bottles, start selling them on the street. Wow. Sell them on the streets, make your bills. You do that, and we'll give you support. We will help you. Because mm. it's about, are you ready to do whatever it takes? Yeah. You know, with following God, once you strip away all your excuses, you will, see, you will get to see what you really value in life and what is stopping you from turning to God. Some common excuses, I'm too busy. What that means is that you do not value God. If it's too hard, you value comfort more than you value God. Maybe you value what other people think of you more than God. Maybe you value your friendships, your work, your job, your security. Mm. You know, what, what this whole pandemic really, has really revealed is that a lot of people are afraid of the COVID. They give in to fear. They give in and they allow fear. And there is a healthy fear that you should be like, okay, I gotta wear a mask and do this and do that. And yet, when we allow fear to run our lives, our lives go horribly wrong. You know, some of you guys know Yiwen, who was studying the Bible before, previously. And she was so close to becoming a Christian. But she never let go of her fear that things may go wrong. If I put everything into God, what if it goes wrong? I must find my security elsewhere. And you know, when COVID happened, we were saying, you know, we're studying the Bible with her, we're going to talk about her having to stay here anyway to be with the church because there's no church in their hometown, right. you know? And she was like, you know, I'm just, I'm just gonna take my, the life in, my life into my hands anyway and go back home. Mm. Oh. And yet on the very last day before she left Hong Kong, that was when all the COVID was going up and not everyone got the COVID yet. On the very last day before she left, she got COVID. Oh. So that she got it just enough so that when they tested her in Hong Kong, she's fine. She flew wow. in back to mainland China. And then when they tested her when she landed, she had COVID. And she spent six weeks in quarantine. Six weeks. She spent two weeks in the hospital, then two weeks in the quarantine hotel. Then she flew back to her hometown. She spent another two weeks in a quarantine hotel. And it, it's, it's sad because she did all this so that she would not get COVID. And yet she got COVID anyway. You know, someone somewhere has less than you and yet was able to give more. So what is your excuse? We're going to read two stories from Luke. Luke chapter 18, verse 35 to 43. Come on, bro. And then Luke 19, 1 to 10. It's really cool that these two stories they actually follow directly on from one another. It says, as Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received the sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up at him and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. 
So he came down once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Right. Right. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Wow. You know what's really cool, and why are these two stories both together, is here are two men that had a lot of things going against him. Yeah. One guy was blind. One guy was like, I mean, looking for, like, if you're looking for Jesus, it'd be a bit hard if you don't have eyes, right? So he was looking for Jesus, and he were trying to stop him. Everyone around him was like, don't go to Jesus. Don't look for him. Stop crying out to him. And yet it says in opposition to all of these things, he shouted even louder. He knows that there's so many things going against him that he needs to be even more passionate about seeking God. And as a result, Jesus went to him and was like, man, I see that you have faith. How do I know your faith? Because you're trying so hard yeah. to be close to me, to get my attention. Right. Well, Could Jesus say the same of you? You know, then he went to Jericho and he saw this other guy, Zacchaeus. This guy had the biggest problem ever. He was short. He was short. He couldn't see over the crowd. He's not like our brother Jeff. I can see it over everyone everywhere all the time. And yet... He goes, I'm short, I can't see. Some people will just go, well, I can't see Jesus anyway. May as well, you know, go home. Or may as well, oh, I'll just sit here and I'll just listen to people see what Jesus is saying or something like that. And he was like, no. He's like, hmm, calculating. Jesus is going to go over here. There's a tree. I'm going to go climb the tree. Yeah. Imagine if people wore like tunics and stuff, like basically dresses back then. So imagine him climbing the tree. He would have looked so stupid, True. to be honest. True. And yet he was like, I'm going to do anything I can to see Jesus. Yeah. And as a result, Jesus is like, I'm coming to your house today. Yeah. And why did you say this man is also a son of Abraham? Because Abraham was someone who looked for God. And in this way, Zacchaeus also looked for God. You know, I do have, I have a conviction. I have a conviction. While Nikkei is still doing her PhD, which I've mentioned a few times now, no one can ever say that you're busy. Say that you are busy, but have you ever been so busy that you were trying to do a meeting, go to a wedding, and you were trying to do your work, and you were so busy that you had to have another, you had to have another disciple spoon feed you food. Oh Two spoons to shiny, one spoon to Nikki. Two spoons to shiny, one spoon. Have you ever been so busy you had to have someone else? feed you while you're working so that you could come to church on time. Wow. I didn't think so. You know, someone who's again overcome all things. Again, with Mrs. Chandrawati, who is again the 105 year old lady who got baptized, you know, so remember that? What's amazing is that before she started to study the Bible, this is what her family said about her, that she, well, she can't walk anywhere. She has to be carried everywhere she goes. She's bedridden. She'd stopped eating. And you can barely hear her speak. Like, it's more like yes, no kind of thing. You can barely hear her speak at all. Um, and she said about over two days, got baptized. First of all, she comes from a totally Hindu background. Yeah. So at 105, after living over 100 years of believing in Hindu gods, you know, the brother and sister studying Bible with her was like, well, you have to stop believing that those gods, those gods are all fake. Jesus is the only God. Every other God you've believed in over the course of 100 years you've lived, they're all unreal. They're all fake. And then she had to change that, change that belief, and become a Christian. Right after she became a Christian, she went to church. It's like over an hour and a bit. Remember, this lady cannot walk. She has to be carried to church. And she was carried there. She was there. She was smiling. All the disciples were taking selfies with her and stuff like that. But you know, she was fired up to be at church. She was a disciple. She goes to midweek, she goes to Bible talk, she goes to all the things. Again, she can barely, she can't walk and she can barely speak. But she is fired up to follow Jesus. What is your excuse? It's time to drop all your excuse. You need to study the Bible and be saved. You know, if you're already studying the Bible with the Christians, my challenge to you is to drop everything 
that is distracting you from God. Give it all up right now. Just give it all up. Study the Bible every single day and be baptized within the next seven days. If you haven't been studying the Bible with a Christian, if you're not in a Bible study, my challenge to you is this. Study the Bible every day in the next seven days and watch your life radically change and come alive. Now, the title of the lesson is Back to Life. Point number one is, have you gotten used to being dead? It's comfortable being dead. You don't have to move. But it's not where you want to be, trust me. Point number two, do you believe in resurrection? Do you believe that your situation it can change? Or have you given up on that idea as well? Point number three, do whatever it takes to come alive. And to finish out today, I'm going to leave you with the words to the song from The Greatest Showman, Come, come Alive. You stumble through your days, got your, got your head hung low, your skies a shade of gray. Like a zombie in a maze, you're asleep inside, but you can shake away. Because you're just a dead man walking, thinking that's your only option. But you can flip the switch and brighten up your darkest day. Sun is up and the color is blinding. Take the world and redefine it. Leave behind your narrow mind. You'll never be the same. Come alive, come alive. Go and ride your light. Let it burn so bright, reaching up to the sky. And it's open wide, you're electrified. When the world becomes a fantasy and you're more than you could ever be because you're dreaming with your eyes wide open. And you know you can't go back again to the world that you were living in because you're dreaming with your eyes wide open. So, come alive. To God be all the glory.